to Norco Colleges Would You Like to Know More About? This is episode two, Engagement Centers. I'm Melissa Bader, I'm a professor of English at Norco College, and I'm here with Alex Spencer, one of our Engagement Center classified professionals, an amazing person overall. Alex, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us about yourself a little bit and what you do here at Norco College. Yeah, no, uh, excited to be here. Um, my name is Alex Spencer. Alex is completely appropriate, I always tell students. Um, I serve as an educational advisor here in the Engagement Center, and a, um, lucky to have been here now for just about four years. Um, proud product of this very school myself. Uh, I came here many years ago as a community college student. Um, I get a chance to really be one of those first individuals that connects with students um, as they're starting their journey here at Norco College. Um, really lucky position that I get to sit in. Um, but I uh, really can't say enough great things about Norco College and a, uh, in my time here so far. That's terrific. And you, uh, you're a classified professional, and I want to really highlight the fact that our classified professionals are so spectacular and work so hard in our Guided Pathways and Equity efforts across the college. And what, uh, where'd you get your education? Mm -hmm. It's a um, loaded question. Uh, it totally is. It totally <laughs> is. Uh, am I allowed to say this? Go dogs. Yes. Um, so um, I, again, I started my time here as a, as a community college student. I actually have a, a pretty unique educational story, um, particularly when you factor in that I now work in higher education as a professional. Um, I won't bore you with elementary school and middle school, of course not, uh, but I showed up at the doorsteps here um, early 2000s as a 23, 24 year old high school dropout. And I um, just started plugging away at some classes, wasn't quite sure what I was planning on doing. Um, started to experience some success academically and I uh, was really enjoying it. So um, many years later, I had a chance to transfer to Cal Poly Pomona where oh, I completed. Oh, I'm a Bronco too. Are you really? Yes. No way. I <laughs> am a Bronco as well. Um, did not know that. Yes. Uh, uh, so yeah, uh, transferred to Cal Poly Pomona. I completed a, what's known as organizational communications degree, and a, um, through meeting the right people and a, uh, really applying myself, I got a chance to go off to grad school, which is crazy to think about. Um, this is where Melissa Bader and I have a, a, another connection as well. Um, spent two years in Seattle, where I attended the University of Washington, the Graduate School of Social Work. Um, where I completed a master's degree in social work there. Uh, two amazing years, we are just talking about it, and a uh, really a, a pivotal part of, of my life and who I've become today. So um, yeah, pretty pretty unique journey to start as a high school dropout and, and many years later um, now working in education with a master's level degree. Right, and I think it's, I'm gonna assume that's a very helpful story when you're talking to students. Yeah, it's a great way to, to make some connections. Not everybody shares that story, right? I, right. I recognize that. But um, the, for the students that do, um, or the students that may have some apprehension about starting their college journey, um, I can relate to it because I was, I was that same person many years ago. And arguably, it's one of the things that has brought me here. Um, I've got a chance to uh, dabble in higher education, four-year university level, um, and the opportunity to come back and really quote unquote, serve my own people, mm -hmm. um, is why I tell students I'm the honored and privileged one to be able to sit down and chat with you today. That's amazing. Why don't we start with, for some of our listeners, they may not be as familiar, could you run us through the onboarding process? What a student does when they come to Norco College or to get to Norco College? Yeah, so of course, always begins with the application process. I was mentioning this to a student yesterday. Um, as, as one of those all-access institutions uh, here in the California Community College system. Um, we accept anybody and everybody who wants mm -hmm. to be here, which is a, a, a great thing, um, even for folks like myself. Um, but nonetheless, uh, once they've got that application and they've gone through the orientation process, um, they're prompted to either meet with an individual like myself, um, Nellie Prada, our other educational advisor um, and great teammate here in the Engagement Center, um, or dependent on their understanding of, of kind of where they're going academically, we right. even prompt them to potentially meet with uh, right away with an academic counselor. Uh, for those students that choose or maybe need a little bit more guidance in terms of the direction that they go from an educational standpoint, that's where they're connected with myself and Nellie. 
um, we go through a, a pretty thorough conversation. Melissa, last, um, we're lucky if it only takes an hour. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's an expectation that we can kind of run through those conversations with students in 30 minutes or less, and a, um, arguably, it's very difficult to do that. I'm sure I, that's that's a lot of empathy and emotional support that you have to kind of work through with a student to get to that honest place because there's a lot of barriers. They are nervous. They are maybe feeling like they don't belong. They are unsure in many ways about what's happening next. And even the most prepared student is not sure about what's happening next. Absolutely. And one of the things that I work really hard to do is, is to try to normalize that, right? I think a, um, there's lots of folks that come here with all those same thoughts, feelings. They're both excited and nervous and anxious all at the same time. And a, um, one thing that I work really hard to do is, is to just try to let them know that that's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. uh, they're making big decisions, right? Huge decisions. And, a, um, and with those big decisions come a certain amount of of stress and anxiety, um, but also excitement as, sure. as they're starting to venture in into quote unquote, the, quote unquote this new part of their life. Right. Um, and that's not just for our fresh out of high school students. Oh no, I think a lot of our returning students, I don't, I have told the story to others. Uh, my mother was a returning student to community college when I was in high school. She had not completed her degree and she made my dad go with her to sign up for classes. Not that he was gonna do anything or just to be there as a support system. And she tells that story and then she went from community college to the, the local um, university and then she went and got her master's and then she was teaching community college English. So she was telling those students the same stories and she was a returning mother with adult children who were in college yeah. and she still was having all of those emotional, I don't belong, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't like this. And while I'm excited and I know intellectually this is a good decision for me at this time, those emotions are very strong and we lose a lot of students in that moment because any barrier that pops up can derail them. Yeah. And one, one thing you may not know, I think it happened just prior to you getting here, was we were asked during the California Community College project that we were in, the GP20, mm -hmm. run by NCII, to examine the onboarding process and to count how many days it took to get from state application, which is in and of itself a bit of a barrier because it requires a lot of information, requires a lot of personal information, and that can be intimidating to full onboarding students with either an appointment to see someone or a plan. Yeah. And minimally, it took about three weeks for that to happen when we started examining that process. And it was very eye-opening to go through it and to look at it. And I know a few of us went and actually applied and went through the whole process to see what happens. That was a big shift in our moment for guided pathways. So pillar two is get them on the path, yeah. right? Yeah. So looking at onboarding, looking at how you get students in the door, sitting in classes on the first day of classes. That process now takes, well, not the first day of classes. Let's skip <laughs> that part. The process of application to potentially talking to you. How, how long does that take now? About 48 hours. Wow. Yeah, about what a, That's hours. a huge win. We have to really... We have to think about that for a second. Yeah. Three weeks to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And what have, so I've applied, what have I done now that's different in that process? Um, a lot of things. I think a, uh, not just getting a chance to really revamp the orientation and, mm -hmm. and, and focus on, I, I gotta be honest with you, instead of quizzing students on whether or not they were paying attention during the orientation process, which was a, 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 a kind of former step that we right. used, um, we now present them with options, information, um, special programs as an example. Um, we've run through a certain section and that was provided in the last one as well, the last iter uh, iteration of the orientation. But instead of saying, or 
quizzing them, testing them on the information that was provided. Welcome it, to college. You've got yeah. a test. You're not even in school yet, but here, take this here, test. Take this one, um, and good luck. <laughs> yeah. Um, we didn't prompt you or let you know that we would be testing right. you as well. Um, instead of testing them, we now provide them an opportunity to say, these are some of the things that might be of interest to me. Oh, but wait, time out. We did test them. We tested them on English and math, mm -hmm. and we said, ooh, you're not any good at this. Why don't you go over here now? The very first thing we said to them was, you're not any good at this. What were you doing during high school? Uh, I or it's been 15 years since high school. Why don't you just go back, right? And in my field, we were some of the worst. We, went, we had them go back three classes and said, you have to get through. So the very first thing we said to students was, you actually don't measure up. You are looking at one of those students here. So um, wow. I remember the assessment test, um, completing it here, and thinking to myself, I'm pretty sure I know how to divide fractions. And um, in that moment, I clearly did not. So um, You probably I, did. It was probably just your, your anxiety level was so high. Absolutely. absolutely. I'm, I'm going to mess this up for the rest of my life on this one test. And it took me um, to name the classes specifically, English 50A, English 50B. I'm sorry, 60A, 60B, and English 50 before I even made it to English 1A. Wow. So, I've, I, again, I can speak to those experiences myself. Um, recognize the value of, of uh, AB 705 and getting students directly into um, those college-level courses that are going to apply towards uh, the degree or mm, transfer process that they're, they're ultimately focused on. And a, um, not to say that there wasn't any value. I, arguably, I, I needed some of it. But recognizing, too, that there it created a huge barrier for students to actually make progress towards the completion of their degree. Um, I love now being able to connect students directly to classes that quote unquote make sense, right? Yeah, and, we, and that helped them move forward. We are, statistically, we looked at the leaky pipeline in particular with English, and I can talk about English yeah. off the top of my head. Um, close to 80% of the students who entered into 60A were not gonna get all the way through to 1A. Yeah. And, and the success rate by the end was like 8%. It was this terrible number if you were tenacious enough to continue to take the classes and that you had the time and the money and the energy to yeah. do those classes. So yeah, AB 705, uh, counseling students, helping them to see where they really belong, where they might need support, and then putting that support directly into the classes, that seems like such a better system. And I, I'm a little ashamed that we hadn't thought of it before. <laughs> But those those are the things that Guided Pathways has really helped us to do, yeah. is to move in through some of those barriers. So you, you were part of the initial, you are the inaugural group who are in the engagement centers. So when you came in, put yourself back there, what was the vision? What was the idea behind an engagement center? It was a it was a little bit of time ago, so it's it's um, it's difficult to pre COVID, right? So um, a little bit of time ago, um, but I think the idea, the overarching idea of the engagement center is that we would do quote unquote all engagement, um, a one stop shop per se, where mm -hmm. students could come through and get everything that they need. We had conversations about having rotating special programs in the engagement center. Um, counselors there to be able to assist them if myself or Nellie had, uh, just um, couldn't provide the right answers or um, recognizing too that we have different roles as an educational mm -hmm. advisor mm -hmm. and a counselor. Um, but there was this idea that we would work not just with incoming students but returning students in, as well and kind of provide every different level of engagement that could take place on campus um, right there. We even spoke about having ASNC, our Associated Students of Norco College, um, on a consistent um, kind of schedule where they were inside the engagement center, uh, kind of participating and, and meeting with students, connecting with them. So there were some challenges, of course, with, with just the two of us um, and, uh, and our assessment uh, coordinator as well. Um, we had an enrollment services uh, assistant there too. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest challenges, Melissa, I would say, is the idea of um, kind of separating the engagement centers based off the schools. I think oh, that, okay. was, that was one of the biggest challenges, okay. if you ask me. Um, the idea that Nellie and, and one of the engagement centers would really serve our business and STEM students, where I and the other, other engagement center would solely focus on our, our social and behavioral science and arts and humanities majors. Um, Wait, why was, that a, why was that a challenge? I think the, the biggest challenge was um, from like a workflow standpoint. 
uh, we were getting connected with students, and at that point, um, they at times weren't always aware as to what school or what program they would be a part of. Okay. Okay, that was one of them. Um, second one was that uh, really when we take a look at the breakdown of where students are gravitating towards, um, it really meant that there were times where Nellie was wildly busy because we have a lot of folks that come right. for our business and STEM programs. And a, um, not that we don't have great folks coming for our uh, crime scene investigation certificate or the amazing arts programs that we have here, um, but there, there are some areas where we see larger populations, larger demographics of students gravitating towards. Do you think that might, and I, I know you don't have any research to back this up other than anecdotal and what you know, do you think that's because the areas of STEM and business tend to be pretty prescriptive to begin with? I think that there is an expectation placed on students that they should already know what they want when they get here. Um, and there are some things out there that are quote unquote easy to know, right? Like I want to be an engineer or I want to be a business. Arguably I hear it a lot from students. Um, I'm going to be a business major because I want to make money. And, oh, okay. and I'm like, okay, hey, there, there's nothing good. wrong with that, right? <laughs> there's lots of money to be made in this area as well. I always like to laugh about it and say, if you want to make some money, like let's have you go and be a plastic surgeon. Like they make really good money. Um, but I think, yeah, that, that expectation that's placed on students and they, they come not just apprehensive about the decisions that they're making, um, but also are feeling the pressure like those Thanksgiving Day conversations, right? Oh, oh so you're at Norco College. At college. Tell me a now. little bit about what you're doing there, right? right. And a, um, so they come already with some preset ideas. The idea too that I think that like they're only interested in the things that they've been exposed to. And it's really easy to be exposed to some types of careers. But when working with students through the career exploration process, one of the main things that's different now that we do in the Engagement Center, um, even I am always surprised at careers that I didn't even know existed. And how can we expect students to be interested in them if they don't even know those careers exist? 100%. And I'm going to yes and you. And are they ready to make a decision? And I know there's been a ton of work on the informed decision making protocol. What, what are we calling it? It's the, um, they do a battery of questions and talk about whether or not they are actually ready to make a decision. Jethro, Midget, and David Schlinger are working on it, and it's the... Career decision making model. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's been um, arguably the highlight of my time here. Um, and it's really because to see like the light come on in a student's eyes about um, like making a confident decision. Really, the model is, is a decision-making model. Okay. Um, but it's been reframed and redeveloped to really focus on, on careers. Um, listening to the last uh, podcast, sorry to make a plug there. <laughs> um, I love when, when Dr. Fleming talked about beginning with the end in mind. Right. Because it's a statement that I use every single time when talking with students. It's always a, yes, you heard that correct. You haven't even taken a college class yet. And I'm already talking with you about what it is that you want to do after college. Right. It's the um, most effective way. I tell students all the time, if you're struggling to better understand what to do during college, let's not focus on college. Let's focus on the end goal. Um, so it's, it's a pretty amazing tool. Um, it, there are some challenges with getting students to actually use it, right, and, yeah. and presenting it to them. And um, I think it comes down to kind of apprehension about decision making and particularly a, a big one in your life in terms of what you're going to do, quote unquote, for the rest of your life. Um, but I never frame it like that with students. I say this is more about what it is that we're going to do after college. The research shows out there that you're going to make a career change five to seven different times throughout your life. Right. But we've got to have a clear understanding of what you're going to do while you're here at Norco College. So let's focus on the end goal there. Now, this is not, and I, I did give you some leading questions to think about what before, but this is a question I didn't give you, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot. But how could faculty in the classroom extend that conversation that you're talking about having with students when we're teaching our classes? So I don't expect faculty to be a quote unquote expert in all careers that are out there, okay? um, or even within their areas. 
guess I mean this in the most appropriate way, you mentioned during the last one that all of your career so far has been in academia. I am one of the few people, although I have moved. I mm -hmm. taught first grade, <laughs> junior high school, and now I teach college. So mm -hmm. I just kept going up until they got my jokes. And then I, <laughs> and then I stuck there for a little while. It worked. It worked. Um, so I think continuing, if, if faculty can continue to um, stress to students, I've got to preference this statement with, um, I have truly bought in into education, so much so that I now do it as a I'm career. Say, and you're here. <laughs> that I do it as a career. Um, if I think if we can continue to encourage students to recognize that the education is a means to an end. Mm -hmm. I, it, I, I think we're no different than any other workforce development program that's out there. Mm. I really do. Um, I think we as educators, and of course I do it as well because education has literally changed my life. Right. Um, so it can be more, but I don't think that it always has to. I think it, if we can allow it to provide folks with meaningful life experiences while also giving them an opportunity to quote unquote live the life that they want, I think that's the like key when it comes to education. Um, so if we can continue to allow faculty and, and encourage them to encourage students to think about what happens after they complete that degree um, or, or the hypothetical rhetorical question that I always provide to students when they start with educational programs, I say, that's great you're interested in something like computer science. Explain to me what you're going to do with that degree when, it, when you completed it. Right. And I always hear a like a pause, and then the student follows up with, that's a great question that I haven't figured out yet. And I follow it up with another rhetorical question, which is, then how do you know computer science is the right direction for you? So that's a, that's a big, that's a really big sticking point in the American academic system, right? We're, we're very much based in that um, Renaissance model that you should be and the enlightenment, yeah, right? That yeah. you should have this well-rounded educational model. And we are challenged often on that model. And if you look at other places where they have very developed educational systems, they don't have that same type of model. And, and I think we go back and forth between trying to decide as a system, how are we going to do this, right? Are we helping students to learn, to have critical thinking, to give them opportunities to grow and mature before they are faced with, what am I going to do with myself? Or are we leading them on a very prescribed path with skills and tools and abilities that are going to help them enter into that workforce? And it needs to be a marrying of those things, in my opinion, because Having an 18-year-old come right out of high school and enter into the workforce, I think they're going to be ill-equipped in terms of their most, I will, I will take that back, most students, mm. most people yeah. at 18, I know I was completely unable to make any decisions. <laughs> uh, and, and to get, to make the good path choices, right? I, I talked to my daughter a lot when she was going through school, and I just said, I just want you to have options. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I'm having you do all of these different things. I want you to have options. Now, many of our students come to us, first-time college students in their family, and there's a lot of pressure in that. There's very few people to ask questions of because you either don't want to embarrass the people at your home because they don't know the answers to your questions, or you need to pretend that you've got it all together because they are putting a lot of energy and effort into you. So yeah. if you show that you don't know, that's going to make them question that decision. So those two things happening at the same time. Yeah. How do you think that engagement work that you do can help those students in particular? So first, let me address the um, idea of enlightenment. Right. Kind versus, of, I kind versus, of breezed right versus, past that. Versus <laughs> skills. Okay? Um, when you talk about the Merriam of, uh, of them, I think it's exactly that. I think it's both. I, th I, I think it can be both. I don't think it necessarily needs to be both, but I think it can. Um, I think it really depends on the student. I think for some students, myself included, um, I needed that opportunity to develop my critical thinking skills, my communication skills, 
um, have a quote unquote better understanding of the world around me mm. because I lacked it. Mm -hmm. I really did. Um, and then I needed hard skills that I could go and apply mm -hmm. towards whatever future was in my path. Um, so I think it can be both. But then I recognize that there's a lot of folks who, um, especially here at Norco, when we think about our non-traditional students, um, I've met so many folks that come here and say, Alex, I really just need to complete those courses so I can like complete the CNC operating certificate and go and do that. I already do the work, right? but quote unquote, they're paying me less, right? right. And, and, and I've got a promotional opportunity if I just go and do that. Right, and um, we don't talk about those students enough because mm -hmm. they, they are very important and we, and we need to honor them the same way we honor the students who are here for a degree, right? The certificate students, a lot of times get the and certificate students experience, yeah. right? And certificate, and mm -hmm. certificate. We need to be recognizing that as part of our mission. It's a valuable um, opportunity that we're providing here right. at Norco in a wide variety of those career and technical education programs. Um, I explain to students all the time, they're, they kind of give me a, I say, let me, let me first again preference it with, I'm not telling you to not go to college. I'm actually here to do the exact opposite. But there's lots of meaningful, careers and life opportunities that are out there without having you go through, quote unquote, the traditional four-year college experience. Mm -hmm. So um, now when it comes to the engagement center and kind of serving as a bridge between those gaps, um, I think the one thing that we've really framed ourselves around is the, the career decision. I, I think helping students um, arguably be immensely confident in the direction that they're going from an education standpoint is part of the reason why we're focusing on careers first. So we have um, so many folks who come through, like you said, really struggling to make um, some of those decisions about what their future is going to look like. And then being able to effectively communicate that with family members and support systems. Mm -hmm. um, how unmotivational is it when you meet a student and you ask them what they're doing this semester and they say, oh, I'm, I'm completing general ed. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's a valuable component of the, or valuable part of the process, particularly for folks who um, plan on completing an associate's degree or moving on to complete a transfer process and ultimately their bachelor's level degree. Having a clear understanding of the direction that you're going towards just provides that kind of up, the, the utmost level of confidence. Um, I can't tell you enough how many students have come back and said, do you know what, now that I've made this decision and I've clearly gotten, quote unquote, on path, um, I'm able to, to go home and effectively communicate to my parents, to my loved ones, that this is the end goal. And the steps that I'm taking right now are what are leading me towards that. So it's, it's a pretty amazing, amazing uh, opportunity there. I, for, I was for me. super tickled the first time I was teaching a class and someone showed me their path sheet. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I helped to make those. But it, it is tangible. Yeah. Right? And I'm, and I'm not taking anything away from the, you know, educational plan that was made before. But that path sheet is, is, is colorful and, and a little sexy. And it makes it so find that you could hand it to a parent or a loved one and say, this is what I'm doing. And I think that, that that answers a lot of those questions. And it gives you that foundational, you know, little little net underneath you to yeah. make sure you know where you're you're at the yeah. whole time. So I have I have two final questions we want to go through and neither one is very small. <laughs> what happened during COVID? Um, complete reshape as to how it is that we do and, and what it is that we do as well. I think it was at that time that we were starting to um, not only be trained on, um, but start to reshift our focus in terms of those conversations. It was no longer, let me just provide you with an insane amount of information and hope that you pick up the important pieces, mm -hmm. um, where we slowed down the conversation and really, again, like, like Dr. Fleming mentioned, uh, begin with the end in mind. So we really started to focus on the, the career aspect and, and providing folks with a tool, a strategy to make a confident decision from a career standpoint. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to laugh for just a second. During a global pandemic, when no one knew what was going on in the future, you started changing your conversation to, well, let's think about the future. That did that not create a little tension? 
Um, not really. I think a, uh, oh, yeah, I don't think it was something that we even d discussed. Um, it, it was one of those where we just recognized the data out there that, that we've done here uh, shows that somewhere around two thirds of students come in with at least an idea, but um, right. also completely unsure right. as to what it is that they want to do both during and after college. Um, so we couldn't just sit around any longer and keep our fingers crossed that they figured it out. So um, yeah, we, we had to, to reshape and revamp what it is that we did. Um, of course, everything moved online, which um, initially was a little bit of a challenge. I was used to this, right? right. Sitting down literally knee to knee with students in the, in the spaces that we have. Um, so it, it, it did require us a shift of quote unquote the format. Right. Um, but arguably what we found is that students Particularly, I don't know if we should re a new age set. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, no, we do have new students. I mean, there's a there's a new group of students coming in for sure. They um, they loved the tech and kind of online approach that came. With you know, them. I've heard that. I've heard that the counseling department there, no shows went to basically zero, and because students could, they didn't have to drive in. Correct. They they had a time that worked for them. They could mm -hmm. just pop in on their Zoom and they were good and as long as they had a connection that was quick and easy and it made sense to them. There were a few that I met on their cell phones in Starbucks as right. they were sitting there uh, having their coffee. Right. So, um, and then it, 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 instead of providing brochures and hey, th think about applying to this program or um, here's the Norco College Promise program, see if it's something that you're interested in. Um, now what I'm doing is I'm providing them the form and saying, hey, if you're interested, let's get you applying to the Norco College Promise Program. Uh, you might be able to receive some benefits from the DRC. Here's the interest slash application form. Go ahead and fill it out right now. Provide them a link in the chat. And instead of them walking out with brochures and hoping that it was something that they looked into and, and tried to start the process, it was here's the form. You can do it right now as we're sitting here chatting. Right. So um, just the immediacy which I think we recognize as something that um, these current generations really value. Right? I have handed out your text number to mm -hmm. a lot of students. It's on my syllabus. You know, if you need help, get to the engagement center. You can email them or you can text them. Mm -hmm. And I think just breaking that barrier down probably was huge, that they could text someone and someone would answer them. That so many more students. It's the way people are communicating yes. now, right? So it just goes, it makes sense that that's the direction that we move towards. And my hope is as as we are, quote unquote, exiting um, the, the, the COVID experience There, there is here. no exit. We're rebuilding. We're not, you know, think about it that way. We're just starting from new. We're mm -hmm. rebuilding. And actually, that brings me to my last question for you. Yeah. You now have all the power and all the money, and you, Alex, are going to design the next 15 years, because we certainly don't want to do anything that doesn't get revised in those that amount of time, engagement centers at Norco College. What would you, what would you expand? What would you build? Would you, yeah, what would you do? So I think um, when it comes to just the amount of us, right? And, and when I mean us, I mean myself and Nellie, um, we would love to connect with every single first time student. Um, mm -hmm. Not everyone needs the very intimate and thorough conversation that we have. Some students come and they are um, wildly prepared in terms of their, uh, the direction that they want to go to from an education and both a career standpoint as well. Um, but the, still, there's still some value in meeting with yes. those students as well and explaining what I always talk to at the very end, the extra stuff. Right. Um, let's talk about the honors program. Let's talk about Puente, Emoja, um, the Pride Center, right. everything that... I frame it as departments, programs that have been designed and developed to support you on your path to success. So right. even those students can, can take advantage of those uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations as well. Um, it's taxing with, with myself and Nellie. Um, and this we need more people, that's yeah, for so sure. That would be the first thing is, is expanding. But it's not just me. I would argue, um, I know this is outside of the engagement center, so I apologize no, for that. No, bring it on. Um, Folks like Natalie Aceves plays mm -hmm. a vital role. Oh, transfer. Right? Vital role. And she's over there one person. Oh, yeah. She's killing it. Right? We, she really is. Yeah. But I could recognize that she needs a vast amount of extra help and support to right. be able to do what she does or do what the transfer center is designed to do well. Correct. And we have a lot of students that come with that being their educational goal, moving on to a bachelor's level degree. Um, we could use some help in folks in areas like CTE, adult education. 
because we have so many folks that come looking for that as well. So again, I know those are outside of the engagement center. No, I don't think so. Because I'm what I'm hearing you say is that engagement center isn't it's actually kind of looped back to what you were saying originally was that this idea that the engagement center would be in many ways that touch point for students as they are at Norco College. Yeah. Not just that initial get them on the path conversation, but any conversation they're having where they need that clarity and a conversation about what's happening next, yeah. right? Either transfer or I'm in the middle of this and I wanna explore this that place they know they can go where there's going to be someone who can at least point them in the correct direction. So you mentioned that someone, I'll, I'll finish on this. Um, you pinged my my brain when mm -hmm. you were mentioning the story of your mom mm -hmm. and, a, um, and your father that uh, attended like the first time she went as well. Um, and that's because every conversation that I have where a parent joins, um, I make sure to take the time out of the conversation to thank them. Mm -hmm. Because I recognize that one, I can't do it all on my own. And two, um, the support systems that we develop around students are arguably um, one of the most successful strategies to ensuring that they continue to move in the, the direction that makes sense for them. So I wanna um, take a second to say thanks for all those folks, um, not just myself that supports students, everybody here across campus. Correct. Um, folks like yourself as well. And, a, um, and parents and your father and say thanks to him too. Yep. Um, because it, uh, any person, and I can speak to this from an individual who showed up here as a, a high school dropout, a first generation college student, somebody who unfortunately experienced like extreme poverty. Um, those people who supported me along the process is the sole reason why I'm here today. And so um, take a second to say yeah. thank you to all of you. That, that's a great place to, to end. We have had such a great conversation and I thank you so much, Alex Spencer from the Engagement Center coming to talk to us today. I'm Melissa Bader and this is Norco College's Would You Like to Know More About Engagement Centers. It's been my honor and privilege. Thank you.